Chapter 13 It had been the driest summer on record, so when the heavy rains came in mid-August, everyone said it was a blessing. People were tired of rationing water. It rained for four days straight, a pelting, pounding rain that swelled the streams and rivers, flooding backyards and carrying away lawn furniture in the dead of night. Meteorologists shrugged. They couldn't explain it either. Jenna lay in bed, stretching lazily, still not ready to get up, and stared up at the water stain in the corner of her room. She hated the very sight of it. It had, <clears throat> it had been caused by the same leak her father had been patching the day he died. She had painted over it twice, but the stain continued to bleed through the white paint. Sometimes its blurred, rust-colored outline actually seemed to be creeping slowly toward her from the corner of the room, and each morning she swore the stain had grown by at least an inch or two, although she, know, she knew this was impossible. She glanced over the win at the window. Tiny rivers of rain streamed down the pane of glass. Her day four days of this was just too much. The first rainy day she and Andrea had hung out at the mall with their friends. It had been fun, but by the third day they had all grown bored of, with the routine and with each other. She finally dragged herself out of bed, pulled on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, ran a comb through her hair, and headed downstairs. She was standing in the kitchen a few minutes later, buttering an English muffin when Andrea called. So what's it going to be? The mall again? Or should we just rent some good movies and pig out on junk food? Neither. Jenna stared out the window at the rain. She felt edgy. Maybe the weather was getting to her. Let's do something different. Like? I don't know. Let's get on a bus and go somewhere. A bus? You're kidding. Where would we go? Anywhere, she said. It doesn't matter. The shore. Never in a million years had she really thought they'd do it. But two different buses and two hours later, Jenna and Andrea were walking along the beach in Spring Lake. The rain had dwindled to a mist and clung to their hair and dampened their clothes. Andrea wasn't exactly being a good sport about the whole thing. We could have done this on a sunny day, you know, she informed Jenna, brushing wet sand from her legs, a futile effort under the circumstances. Think about it. You go to the beach to get a tan, to meet guys. You don't go to get your skin shriveled up from being in the rain too long. She stuck her foot in the water, rinsed the sand from it, and held it up. My toes look like raisins. So walk in the sand, Jenna told her. It won't make any difference. It's just as wet. She stared down at her tan toes. They're turning white, see? They'll probably all rot and drop off. Jenna let Andrea ramble on, for the most part ignoring her. She was used to Andrea's melodramatics. <clears throat> The cold, gritty foam bit at Jenna's bare ankles as the girls walked along the water's edge. She had no idea why she had wanted to come to this place, but it felt right. She wondered if it had something to do with missing out on Nantucket this August. Every summer, for as long as she could remember, her parents had rented a cottage on the island. But her mother had decided to cancel the trip this year, explaining that she would find it too difficult. Jenna thought she understood. Even now, feeling the wet sand ooze between her toes, she was reminded of the walks along Nantucket Beach with her father. Maybe that was why she had come, to remember. Because although six weeks had passed since his death, Jenna still could not make herself believe that, she wouldn't, that he wouldn't be coming home. Some stubborn part of her continued to think her father was on one of his business trips, and all the logic in the world could not make Jenna stop holding on to this fantasy. As she stood by the water, looking at the gray sky blending into the gray water, unable to distinguish between the two, unable to determine the horizon, she tried to imagine the sun rising again and found that she couldn't. The waves pulled at her feet, sinking them deeper into the sand until they disappeared altogether and her body seemed to be balancing precariously on her ankles. Andy, she kept her eyes on the gray scene in front of her. Yeah? Andrea? stood next to her, making designs on the sand with her big toe. I have this picture in my head, you know. I'm in a courtroom, and the jury's just found this guy guilty of killing my dad. And I walk over to the table where he's sitting with his lawyer, and I look him right in the eye, and I ask him point blank if he knows what he's done. If he knows he's, he destroyed three lives that day. Not just my dad's, but my mom's and mine. Because that's what he did. He killed all of us. I want him to know that. 
and when I can tell him I've, I'm finally getting through to him, well, I'm going to pull this gun out from under my sweater, and I'm going to shoot him right there in front of the whole courtroom. Oh, God, Jen, you don't mean that. Yes, I do, and you can leave God out of it. We're not exactly on speaking terms right now. This isn't like you at all. Jenna turned to look at Andrea. What's, it, what's that supposed to mean? Oh, Andy, do you really think I'm still the same person I was six weeks ago? You're scaring me. Andrea had backed away from the edge of the water. She stood with her shoulders hunched, her arms hung at her sides defensive, defenselessly. I'm not deranged, Andy, okay? I'm just angry. She stared down at her footless legs and sad. Oh, I wish I could know how, I wish you could know how sad, but you can't. No one can. Andrea took a cautious step back into the waves as if, as if testing the water. She put her arms around her friend. I wish I could know too, she told her. It was late afternoon and raining harder than ever when they got back to Briarwood. I can't stand these wet clothes another minute, Andrea said, passing up Jenna's offer of a soda and heading straight to the, for the path between their houses. I'm out of here. Jenna climbed the front porch steps, relieved retrieved the mail, glanced through through it for any interesting magazines, and was about to toss it all on the dining room table when she noticed an envelope addressed to her. There was no return address, but when she opened it, she was amazed to find herself staring down at a letter from Amy Ruggiero. It had been over three weeks since the incident in the theater restroom. Jenna couldn't imagine why Amy Ruggiero, of all people, would be writing to her. And so, with intense curiosity, she sat down at the dining room chair, forgetting all about her wet clothes, and began to read. Dear Jenna, I'm the person who was with you in the restroom a few weeks ago when you weren't feeling well. We never introduced ourselves, but I knew who you were from your picture in the newspaper. I wanted to tell you how sorry I was about what happened to your dad, but it didn't seem like the right time, so I thought I'd write you a letter instead. I just wanted you to know that I understand what you're going through. I lost my dad a few years ago, too. Not just my dad, but my mom. They were in a car accident. I was seven when it happened, but I could have, but it could have been yesterday. The pictures in my mind are that vivid. I remember how angry I was. So angry I didn't talk to anyone for almost a year. For weeks. I didn't even let myself cry, because that would be admitting my mom and dad weren't going to come back. I think I honestly believed that as long as I didn't cry, they'd come tiptoeing into my bedroom one night, tuck me in like always, and tell me I'd been having a bad dream. But the nightmare never went away. Then, this one day, I was playing at my grandfather's desk, pretending I was his secretary, and I started rummaging through the desk drawers looking for an envelope for a letter I'd written for him, and there was this plaster cast of my hand that I'd made for my mom in kindergarten. I'd painted it bright pink. I still don't know how it got there. Maybe my grandfather was saving it for me or something. Anyway, when I turned it over, I saw my mom had taped a little strip of paper on the back. She'd written, Amy's hand, age five. I love this child more than life itself. I don't know why she wrote that on there, of all places, but I'm glad she did. Because it was as if she was sending me this message, you know? I think that... The, that was the first time I realized she really wasn't coming home, and I just put my head down on the desk and sobbed my heart out. It must seem like I'm rambling here. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to share this with you because you seem like a nice person, and I thought it might help to know you weren't alone. If there's ever anything you need or if you want to talk, just remember I'm here, okay? Yours truly, Amy Ruggiero. Jenna blinked then stared up at the lighting fixture that hung over the dining room table. She had no idea what to think of Amy's letter. They hardly knew each other. She read the letter again, and then a third time, trying to understand. And when she began to read it the fourth time, because now she couldn't seem to make herself stop reading it, she noticed that wet spots were blurring the, the words on the paper. It took her a moment to realize these were tears, her tears. Her fir the first real tears she had been able to cry since her father had died. And there was nothing she could do but put her head down on the table and let them come.